On the first Wednesday of December, Mr. Garushi announced over the PA that in January, every junior and senior in high school in the state would be taking the New York State Standardized Achievement Test, and that we should plan on taking practice exams at home during the holiday break. The reputation of the school was at stake. He told us, he told us, and very, and he was very, very, very confident that we would not let Camilla Junior High down. I'm not sure, but I think Miss Baker may have rolled her eyes. The rest of the morning announcements were as exciting as December jiggles, and maybe Mr. Grushy knew that, because he he said he wanted to conclude by reading a lovely note from Miss Sidman. She wished us all a happy holiday spirit at this very special time of year and hoped that, even in times of war, we might be able to use these holidays to reflect on, on the virtues of peace and goodwill. She hoped all of us, all of this very sincerely. The letter, Mr. Grushy told us, was written from Connecticut, where Miss Sidman was taking a retreat in seclusion. Actually, the whole school was in a happy holiday spirit even before Miss Sidman's letter. On one side of the main lobby, Mr. Vendelary, Vendelary helped had put up had put up a huge fir tree and would and wound it with silver garland balls as big as grapefruits hung from each branch. Plastic ones because last Christmas Mr Valdery had seen had seen what Doug Swit's brother did to the glass ones. Wherever there wasn't a Christmas ball, tinsel hung, hung down, except when the lobby doors opened and it blew straight out. And then, I guess, because Mr. Valdery believed that no Christmas tree should should show any green at all, he sprayed quick drying foam snow all over the whole thing, as though there really might be snow on Long Island on Christmas Day, which hadn't happened since before there was a Christmas Day. On the other side of the main lobby was a menorah. It was heavy and old and belonged in Mr. Somewit's family for a whole lot longer than 200 years. Some of the white wax, some of the white wax that clung to the sides of the bronze cup came from candles that had been lit in Russia. We looked at it, standing on its white linen cloth, as its huge history, as huge as history, and could almost smell, and could almost smell the sweet wax in the darkness of a long time ago. That first week, the second graders made red and green construction paper and chains that hung the that hung the length of the elementary and junior high school walls. The fourth graders cut cut menorahs from cardboard and covered them with glittering aluminum foil. The first graders cut out flames for each of the nine candles. and together put a menorah on every classroom door. The fifth graders had had Charles, who could not only collect erasers, but also write exquisite calligraphy, which made every girl in his grade, and some in the sixth grade, fall in love with him. Just because he could write Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah with loopy swirls, his signs appeared all over the walls, and gushing fifth grade girls colored in colored in the hoops secretly to show their internal love and and devotion to the artist. Danny Hup Hupper said it was just about made him throw up. All through Camillo Junior High there were signs of of the season. The windows on the classroom doors became became crepe paper stained glass. Mr. Petrelli 
put flashing lights colored around put flashing colored lights around his door and a, and a menorah with orange light bulbs on his window shelf. Mr. Ludema, who was from Holland, put wooden shoes on, on his window shelf and filled them with straw and coal, probably because he was Doug Switch's brother, brother's teacher. Miss Baker didn't put anything up, nothing at all. She took down the aluminum foil menra the first grader put on her door, and she wouldn't let any of Charles' signs into the room. When Miss Kabakoff came in carrying a crop of apple cider left over from the second grade pilgrim feast, offering a special holiday drink for lunch, Miss Baker smiled one of those smiles that isn't really a smile, then had Danny help her take the crock and shove it back on the high shelf in the coat room above the motoring lunches. Miss Baker was not in happy holiday spirit, and to be really honest, neither was I, because all of Mr. Goldman and the Long Island Shakespeare Company's holiday extravaganza, in which I was going to play Ariel. Ariel the fairy, and nothing I said to Mr. Goldman helped. Every boy should be so lucky as you to play in Shakespeare Company's holiday extravaganza with such a part, he said. I should have been lucky as you as your age. But let me tell you, wearing yellow tights wasn't making me feel lucky. Not if I wanted to keep living in this town. So I showed the tights to my mother, who I figured would have some concern for her son's reputation. They're very yellow, she said. And they have white feathers all over the... Yes, she said. But it will be cute. They'll sort of wave in the breeze when you walk. I still can't get over it. My son, playing Shakespeare. They're yellow tights. I'm playing a fairy. If this gets out, I'll never be able to go back to school. No one from Camilla Junior High will be there. And even if they were, everyone will think it's cute. I tried my father. I handed him the tights while, Wal while Walter Cronkite was announcing new bombing in Vietnam. I thought they might catch his eye, even though the CBS evening news was on. They did. You're going to wear those, he said. That's what they want. Yellow tights with white feathers on the... Yep. Whose idea is this? Mr. Goldman's idea. My father tried looking away from the yellow tights, which wasn't easy, since they were the brightest thing in the room and tended to draw the eye. Mr. Goldman, he said, I think you've heard the rest of the conversation before. Yes, I said. The Benjamin Goldman, who belongs to the Goldman's Best Bakery? I guess that's the one, I said. My father looked at the yellow tight skin, sort of shielding his eyes, and considered. The day might come, he said. When Goldman thinks about explaining his business, and and then he'll need to hire an architect. Dad. Maybe one of one maybe one that he remembers doing him a favor. I can't wear these, I said. He handed the tights back to me. Wear them. Just hope that no one from your school sees you. I didn't try my sister. But she came to my room anyways. Mom told me about the tights, she said. Let me see them. I showed her. When this gets around school, it won't get around school, I said. Sure it won't, she said. Keep telling yourself that and maybe it'll come true. But if it ever gets over to the high school, you better pray that no one knows I'm your sister. She shut the door. That sure doesn't sound 
sound like a flower child who doesn't do harm to anyone. I hollered after her, but she didn't answer. It didn't help that on the night of the first dress rehearsal, I, I wore my blue jeans over the yellow tights until the last minute. The entire cast of the Long Shakespeare Company's Holiday Extravaganza clapped when I came on stage, which they did because they had to do something when they saw they saw where the feathers were. And what they really wanted to do was laugh out loud. But they knew what I would do, and it was too late to find another kid to play Ariel the Fairy. I mean... Who else was going to wander into Goldman's Best Bakery and be $2.80 short on an order of cream cream puffs? Mr. Goodman, I said after the applause, I can't wear these. Of course you can wear these. You're wearing these now. I look like a fairy. And this isn't the point. You should look like a fairy. You're a fairy. Do you do you know what will happen if someone from school sees me? They will say there is Holling Hood Hood on stage playing one of Shakespeare, Shakespeare's greatest scenes from one of the greatest plays. This is what will happen. Mr. Goldman, it's been a long time since you were in seventh grade. I never went to seventh grade. Where I came from, no boy went to seventh grade. We were all working in fields, digging and hoeing and digging and hoeing. But you go to school, then you come home and play. Then you come on stage and be a famous Shakespeare character. There is more that a boy could want. Without even trying, it it wouldn't be hard to come up with a list of 410 things more that a boy would want. But it's hard to keep complaining after the, when I was a boy, life was so hard, card is played on you. So I did it. I got through the whole dress rehearsal playing Ariel the fairy while wearing bright yellow tights with feathers on the, well, I might as well say it, but they're on my butt. White feathers waving on my butt. Let me tell you, this did not put me in a happy holiday spirit. The whole December could have been ruined because of the yellow tights, except for one thing, one glorious, amazing, unbelievable, spectacular thing. The thing that kept us going in the bare holiday list room of Miss Baker. The one thing that brought back meaning to Hanukkah and Christmas. Mickey Mantle. The greatest player to put on Yankee pinstripes since Babe Ruth, Mickey Mantle. And it was Miss Baker who announced his advent. I suppose it will be one of the interests to some of you. She said that Mickey Mantle is coming to town next week. The class went as quiet as if Socrox and and Calvin the rats, not the monsters, had appeared before us, clacking their appalling yellow teeth. Some interest, Danny Huffler said. To some of us, I said. Who's Mickey Mantle? asked Mer- Meryl Lee. Who's Mickey Mantle? asked my asked my thigh. He's a baseball player, said Miss Baker. He is the baseball player, said Danny Huffer. He had a batting average of .245 this year, said Doug Swick. We all turned to look at him, down from .288 last year, Doug Swick said. Danny Huffer turned to look at me. How does he know that? What is a batting average? Asked Marilee. My brother-in-law, said Miss Baker loudly, has developed strong ties to the Yankee organization, and he has arranged for Mickey Mantle 
to come to Baker's Boarding Euphorium. I am told that in addition to strutting around, swinging, bat, swinging baseball bats as if it were a worthy vacation, he will sign baseballs for anyone willing to bring one to him. A cheer from the class, as if happy holidays were already there. This is not an occasion to clamber on your desk, Mr. Hubford said. You should tell your parents that he is coming a week from this Saturday night and that he will be swinging bats and signing baseballs from 8 o'clock until 9.30. You should all take note that he had been, that he, that had he been swinging bats and signing balls on a school night, I never would agree to make this announcement. Another cheer, wild and extravagant. Who's Mickey Mantle? asked Merrill Lee again. We all ignored her. Mickey Mantle. Now, things would have been fine if Miss Baker had just left it there. I mean, Mickey Mantle, come, Mickey Mantle coming to the Baker Sporting Euphorium and all, but she didn't. I have a second announcement, Miss Baker said. We all got quiet again. Someone else is coming to the Euphorium too, asked Danny Hupfer. Maybe someone I know, asked Merrily. No one is no one else is coming, unless you want to say that say that someone is up and coming. That was a teacher joke. No one laughed, even though we were all supposed to. No one ever laughs at teacher at teacher jokes. I have been informed by Mr. Goldman, who is the president of the Long Island Shakespeare Company. That one of his, uh, that one of the students in our class will be performing in the company's holiday extravaganza. He will be playing the part, playing a part from *The Tempest*. I knew it was coming next. For a while, I had wondered if Miss Baker had stopped hating my guts. Now I figure she hadn't. As the as the corresponding secretary. Of the company, I invite you all to see Mr. Holling Hoodhood in his Shakespeare debut. It will be a week from this Saturday, the very same night that that the Emmett Mr. Mandel or Mr. Mantle will be at the Euphorium swinging bats. The performance should be finished by nine by. 39 minutes before Mr. Mantle makes his exit, so you all have time for both. Toads, beetles, bats. The only thing worse would would have been if she found out, if she found a way to bribe them to come, maybe with cream puffs. And for those of you who attend, said Miss Baker, your ticket stub will bring you an extra credit for your next English for you and me assignment. It was worse. Miss Baker looked at me and smiled. It was like the smile she had before Doug Sleuth's brother assassinate, assa- assassinated an assassination attempt. And shouldn't someone have told me that Miss Baker was corresponding secretary? This is the part where if we lived in a just world, some natural disaster would occur right then, or maybe an atomic bomb attack to, obliter- to, ob- to obliterate the news of Long Island Shakespeare Company, the company's holiday extravaganza, and so save me from my undeserved humiliation. Still, even though there wasn't a natural disaster or atomic bomb attack, Mickey Mantle was almost enough. After all, with Mickey Mantle coming, no one really cared about my Shakespeare debut. No one except Meryl Lee, who didn't know who Mickey Mantle was, and Mai Tai, who also didn't know who Mickey Mantle was. And... Danny 
Huffer, who didn't know who Man- who Mickey Mantle was, and they all con- they all cornered me after lunch. Why so sneaky? Asked Marilee. Are you playing a girl's part? No, I'm not playing a girl's part. It's the it's a part from the Tempest. I said. Gee. So when Miss Baker said you were playing a part from the Tempest, she meant you were really playing a part from the Tempest, said Danny Huffer. We know a whole lot more now than we did before. Ariel, I'm going to play Ariel. That's a girl's name, said Marilee. Isn't that, isn't that a girl's name? Suspicion is an Upbecoming passion. I said, Ariel is a warrior. I know that sounds like a lie, but Prebysterians know know that every every so often a lie isn't all that bad. And I figured that this was about the best place it could happen. Who does a warrior fight? The rebels who, who, so, who ass, assert Prospero's kingdom and who want to murder him and his daughter. That sounds all right, said Danny Hupfer. So you, so you get to fight for them like a knight. Who's their champion? Yes. And you get to wear armor and stuff like that. Said Danny Hupfer. Stuff like that, I said. Maybe I'll come then to see the armor, he said. But it'd better be over in time for Mickey Mantle. It still sounded like it still sounds like a girl's name to me, said Marilee. We ignored her again. And headed back to the classroom. But just before we got to the door, My tie stopped me with a hand on my chest. She looked at me for a long moment and whispered, Not good to be a warrior. I looked at her, I guess kind of startled, and she went in to her desk before I could say anything. But what did she know? At next rehearsal, I asked Mr. Good, uh, Mr. Goldman if Ariel could wear armor instead of yellow tights. Armor? We have no armor, said Mr. Goldman. You have no armor? What, what do you do in a play if you need it? We don't. We don't put on those plays on. We should buy armor. Just We should buy armor just to do Julius Caesar? No. And why should Ariel wear armor? Because he's Prospero's champion. He's fighting like a just like like a jousting knight. Mr. Goldman shook his head. Like a jousting knight? Hauling you're a fairy. Go put on your tights. We have a dress rehearsal. I didn't get to wear any armor. The next Wednesday, as soon as everybody left for for Temple Bethel and Saint Saint Ad- Ad- Adalbert's, Miss Baker took out her copy of Shakespeare from the lower drawer in her desk. Mister Goldman says that you're doing very well, though you need some practice on interpretation. He said that. He did. Open your book to the fourth act. I'll be Prospero. We'll start with what would my potent master and continue through the end begin. He really said I was doing very well and that you need some practice. Begin. What would my potent master, I said, no, no, Mr. Hood Hood. You are enslaved, magical. You are an enslaved magical creature. 
about to be given your freedom. If you perform well these last few moments, you, however, you, however, sound as if you're waiting for the for the crosstown bus. You're almost free, but not quite. What would my potent master? I said. Miss Baker crossed her arms. This is supposed to be a passion in your face. That were that works you strongly. You're on a knife's edge. What would my potent master? I said. Indeed, there you are, said Miss Baker. Stay on the knife's edge, and now, Prospera. I stay on the knife's edge, the knife's edge, because I couldn't help it. When Miss Baker read Prospero's part, it was like Prospero himself had come into the classroom with his flowing cloak and magic and magical hands. She was Prospero, and I was Ariel. And when she gave me my last command and said, Be free and fare thou well, I suddenly knew what Ariel felt. The whole world had just opened had just opened out in front of me, and I could go wherever I wished and be whatever I wanted absolutely free. I could decide my own happy ending for myself. That said Miss Baker should please Mr. Goldman, and it did when we finished rehearsal that night. I could almost imagine myself leaping out into the airy elements and dropping the insubs the insubstantial pageant of life behind me. At least that's what it felt like on the stage. It didn't feel like that in Camilla Junior High, where Miss Baker reminded me reminded the class to purchase tickets in advance. And where I dropped hints almost every day that the Long Island Shakespeare's, Shakespeare Company's holiday extravaganza was going to run really, really long. And that there was no chance in creation that anyone could go see the extravaganza and make it to Mickey Mantle too. I know, another lie. But just a Presbyterian lie. So, the days passed, and the Hanukkah and Christmas decorations in Camilla Junior High started to look a little shabby. And the dress rehearsals were over, and and Saturday night came. And I put on my bright yellow tights with the white feathers on on the butt, and I put my jeans over them. And I found the newest baseball I had, and my father dropped me off at the festival theater. Don't mess it up. And the Long Island Shakespeare Company's holiday extravaganza began. And while Mr. Mr. Goldman played Falstaff by, from Henry the Sixth, I looked out through the peephole in the in the wings, and I could see almost every face, and there weren't many, since anyone with good sense was over at the spot at the sporting euphorium. I found Miss Baker right away. She was in the center of the third row, sitting right next to Miss Biggio and wearing that teacher look that makes it seem as if she's about to start slashing at something with her red felt pen. I suppose teachers just get that way. They can't help it. Behind Miss Baker and Miss Biggio were Danny Huff were Danny Huffer's parents. Really? I guess Danny must have told them about the extravaganza, and they had to come see me play the part of Ariel, the warrior. I guess it didn't matter to them that the the Bing Crosby 
Christmas special was on television tonight, the way it mattered to my parents, who would never, ever miss it. I guess the Hupfers thought that a Shakespeare debut was a whole lot more important than hearing I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. One more time, even though Mr. Hupfer was losing his tie and holding his hand over a yawn. And I guess you can't look out on stage, out stage people is very long because your eyes start to water and stuff and the stuff in your nose gets drippy. And you have to wipe them both. And there goes all your makeup. There wasn't anyone else from Camillo Junior High that I saw that I could see. No one. And except for the very front row, I could see every seat in the theater. Let me tell you, when it was my turn to go on, not seeing anyone from Camillo Junior High made leaping on the stage hollering what would my what, what would my opponent master and wearing yellow tights with white feathers on my butt a whole lot easier i stayed on the nice edge and when mr goldman who was really prospero sent me to fetch the trade the traitors or terrorize caliban or grieve the king i did it as though all, all was at stake. When I reminded him that he had promised me my freedom on the sixth hour, I wanted it as badly as Mickey Mantle's signature on a baseball. And when I drew the boatman into the island, I thrilled at Prospero's line, Thou shalt be free. And when at last it was done, and Prospero stepped on the edge of the stage to beg, to beg the audience to send its gentle breath to fill the sails of our freedom, I could hardly keep myself from trembling. Suppose they wouldn't fill the sails. Our revels are ended, Prospero ha had said. But when I walked on stage with the rest of the com with the rest of the company for curtain calls, the revels felt like they had not ended. They were still ringing in the hands of the audience, who were all standing, still ringing in the hands of Miss Baker, who was smiling at me, really, still ringing in the hands of Mr. and Miss Hupfer, who were waving at me still ringing in the hands of Danny Hupfer and Mary Lee and my tie, who were standing in the very front row. Danny Hupfer and Mary Lee and my tie. I looked at them. Uh, I look. I looked at them, up at the bright yellow light, tights, white with white feathers on my butt. They were looking at the yellow tights. They weren't looking at the yellow tights because they were all three crying. They stood in the in the light from the footlamps, and their cheeks glistened with tears. Shakespeare can do can do that to you. They clapped and clapped and clapped and clapped, and merrily wiped her eyes, and suddenly, in Danny Hupfer's eyes came this startled look and there was a there was a passion in his face that seemed to work him strongly and it was Mickey Mantle. He pointed to his watch, nine fifteen, he mouthed, and turned he turned and he turned and waved desperately at his parents. And when the curtain came down I, and I could be free, I didn't wait for the audience breath to fill my sails after all. I careened back, stay, back, back behind the stage and around to the men's dressing room and found that it was locked. Locked. I pounded on the door. No one answered. 
I heard my name for another curtain call. I pounded on the dressing room door again. No one answered. I ran back into the wings, desperate. Mr. Goldman was still on stage, bowing. It looked like he was bowing for a while. But he had left Russ Bear's blue floral cape behind in the stage. Wings. I grabbed it, flung it around my shoulders, and made it for the elements where my father would be waiting for what I hoped would be an illegally fast drive to the Baker Sporting Euphorium. I ran out the backstage door, and let me tell you, it had gotten a whole lot colder, and the cake and and a cape when you're just wearing yellow tights doesn't help much. And sprinted around to the front of the fiat of the fiesta of the festival theater, my father wasn't there. I guess the Bing Crosby Christmas spe- special wasn't over yet. Standing on the street in front of the festival theater in bright yellow tights and a blue floral cape covering the white feathers on his butt. That was not an aerial in a happy holiday spirit. I looked up and down the street. Not a single car was moving except one speeding away. Danny Hupfer's parents. I decided I would wait for my father for five minutes. So I counted 300 Mississippis. No car. People started to come out of the theater and point at me. And then the scent of diesel fumes came in on breeze, which was cutting right through my floral cape. And across town, and the cross town bus lumbered around the corner, gritty and grimy, and the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. It even had plastic Christmas laws hanging from its rear view mirror. I spotted, I sprinted across the street which probably looked pretty impressive with the blue cape flowing behind me, and stood at the Festival Theater bus stop. But I wasn't sure the bus was going to stop when the driver saw me. He went two or three bus lengths beyond the sign, and even after he stopped, I ran up. He didn't open the doors at first. The plastic Christmas balls rocked back and forth while he looked at me, like I had escaped from someplace I shouldn't have escaped from. I counted another 15 Mississippis before he opened the doors. Who are you supposed to be, kid? John Wayne? John Wayne never wore tights in his whole life. I need to get to the Baker Sporting for him. Well, John Wayne, do you have 30 cents? I reached into my pocket, which wasn't there. I don't think so said the bus driver. Please, I said, I need to get to the Baker Sporting Euphorium since Mickey Mantle is signing baseballs, right? Yes. He looked at his watch. You might make it if you had 30 cents. The quality of mercy is not strained, I said. He looked at me like I had just spoken in foreign language. Please, I said. The driver shook his head. Okay, John Wayne, but this is the kind of stuff that gets bus drivers fired, giving free rides. And if it wasn't so cold out there, I'd close the door on you. Did you know that when that case is blowing out, people can see that you have feathers on your... Yes, I said, and took a seat. It was... It was mercy alone that there was no one else on the bus. We drove through the cold night, well, under the speed limit. The driver slowed down properly at every light, even if if it was still green. He looked both ways twice at every stop sign. Do you think I began, look, I'm missing the Bing Crosby special, and I'm putting my job on the line for you, kid. It's not a great night. So do you want to be quiet or do you want to get out? 
I was quiet. I wrapped the blue floral cape around me. By the time I reached the bus stop a block away from the baker's boarding forum, I was about as frantic as a fairy warrior. Being very quiet can never get The bus driver looked at his watch, 9.37. He said, you better giddy up, John Wayne. He opened the door, and I started down the steps. You have a baseball somewhere under your cape, right? The bus driver asked. I stopped. I stopped. Dead. My baseball was back at the festival theater in the locked men's dressing room. I almost cried. Almost, but I didn't, because if you're in seventh grade and you cry while wearing a blue floral cape and yellow tights with white feathers on the butt, you just have, you you just have to, you just have to curl up and die somewhere in a dark alley. The bus driver shook his head. John Wayne is always prepared for whatever happens. He said, "Me too." He reached under the dashboard and put out a cardboard box filled with stuff. You can't believe what people leave behind on their bus, on their bus seats, he said. He reached in the box and pulled out, I'm not making this up, a perfect new white baseball, every seam tight and clean, like it had never been thrown before. You got no, you got no clothes that any decent person would wear, he said. No bus fare and no baseball. How are we going to make it in this world, kid? At that moment, I truly did not care. I stared at the baseball. Its perfect whiteness filled my whole vision. The bus driver shook his head. You better meet a whole lot of people who are really kind to you, kid. Then he handed the baseball to me. The perfect new white baseball. Merry Christmas, he said. Again, I almost cried. I sprinted to the Baker Sporting Emporium. The blue cape straight out behind me, baseball in hand. Who knows what the white feathers were doing. And I made it. I really did. I slammed, the, I slammed through the door, and there he was, Mickey Mantle. He was sitting at a table, dressed in sh- his street clothes. Behind him, Mr. Mercutio Baker, who owned the the euphorium, had put up a bulletin board full of Yankee photographs, most of Mickey Mantle swinging away. Above them was a jersey with number seven. Mickey Mantle had signed his name below it. He was bigger than he looked on television. He had hands on his lo- he had hands as large as shovels and the four and the forearms that came from his sleeves were strong as stone. His legs stuck out for, stuck out from beneath the table and they looked like they could run down and run down a train on the Long Island Railroad. He yawned a couple of times, big yawns that he didn't even try to hide. He must have had a long day. In front of me, standing at the table, all by themselves, with Mickey Mantle, were Danny Hupfer and his father. Mickey Mantle was just handing a baseball bat, and Danny was just taking it into his hands. It was a sort of, uh, it was sort of a holy moment, and the light that shone that shone around them seemed to glow softly, like something you'd see in one of the stained glass windows at St. Andrews. Thanks, said Danny. He said he said it in awe and worship. Yeah, kid, said Mickey Mantle. Then I came up. Held out the new perfect white baseball and whispered, Can I please have your autograph? And he took the ball from my hand, held his pen over it, and then Mickey Mantle looked at me. Mickey Mantle looked at me, and he spoke. What are you supposed to be? He said. I froze. What was I supposed to say? 
You look like a fairy, he said. I coughed once. I'm Ariel, I said. Air- who? Ariel. Sounds like a girl's name. He's a warrior, I said. Mickey Mantle looked at me up and down. Sure he is. Listen, I don't sign baseball for kids in yellow tights. Mickey Mantle looked at his watch and turned to Mr. Baker. It's past 9.30. I'm done. He tossed my new perfect white baseball onto the floor. It rolled past my feet and into the folds of my blue cape. The world should split in two. The world should split in two, and I should fall into the crack and never be heard from again. Hauling Hood Hood, me, the boy in yellow tights with white feathers on the butt and a blue floral cape. The boy Mickey Mantle wouldn't sign a baseball for. And Danny Hupfer had seen it all. The yellow tights, tights, the cape, the ball, everything. Danny Hupfer, who stepped to the table and slowly placed his baseball, his baseball signed by Mickey Mantle back in front of the greatest the greatest player to put on Yankee pinstripes since Babe Ruth. I guess I don't need this after all, Danny said. He lifted his hand from it, and I could tell it wasn't easy. What's the matter, kid? You're a pied ninny. Said, said Danny Hupfer. Come on, Holling. I picked up the bus driver's baseball and handed it to Danny. We turned and left and left Mickey Mantle behind us. We didn't say anything. When gods die, they die hard. It's not like they fade away or grow old or fall asleep. They die in fire and pain. And when they come out of you, they leave your guts burned. It hurts more than anything you can talk about. And maybe worst of all is you're not sure if there will ever be another God to fill their place. Or if you'd ever want another God to fill their place. You don't want fire. You don't want you don't want fire to go out inside you twice. The Hupfers drove me back to the to the festival theater. I went in to see if the mess, if the men's dressing room was unlocked. It was. And Mr. Go- Goldman was holding forth. My dainty Ariel, he called. He threw his arm out wide, and the company, the men, that is, for the record, all clapped. Where have you been? You, the star of the extravaganza. Something should be wrong. I shook my head. How could you tell, Mr. Goldman, that the gods had died when they lived so strongly in him? Wasn't, wasn't, was it well done? I asked. Bravely, my diligence, thou shalt be free. And it was. And I was. I changed and left the yellow tights with the feathers on the butt in the locker. Mr. Goldman told me I should stop by the bakery for some cream puffs, which will cost you not a thing. And I left. That was it. Outside, it was the it was the first really cold night of winter, and the only fire in sight was the stars above us and far away glittering like ice. The Hupfers were waiting and drove me home. And still, and still did not, didn't talk, not the whole way. When I got back, my parents were in the den watching television. It was so cold, the furnace was on high, the hot air, the hot air tinkled, the silver bells on the decorated and the white Silver bells that decorated the white artificial Christmas tree that never dropped a single pine needle in the perfect house. You're done earlier than I thought, my father said. Bing Crosby is just about to start white Christmas as soon as this commercial is over. How'd it go, Holly? said my mother. 
Fine. I hope Mr. Goldman was happy with what you did, said my father. He did. It was just, he did. It was just slow. Good. I went upstairs. The crying notes of Ben Crosby's treetops glistening and the children listening and sleigh bells in the snow following, following me. Just swell. Happy holidays. When we got back to school on Monday, there were only three more days before holiday break. They were supposed to be a relaxed three days. Most teachers coasted, coasted through them, figuring that no one was going to learn all that much just before vacation. And they had no, they had no leave time. They had to leave time for holiday parties on the last day and making presents for each other. And for looking out the window, hoping for a miracle of snow on Long Island. Even the lun- even the lunches were supposed to have something special to them, like some kind of cake with thick white frosting or pizza that actually had some cheese on it, or hamburgers that hadn't been cooked as thin as a record. Maybe something chocolate on the side, but Miss Biggio wasn't interested in chocolate these days. It could have been the last holiday the holiday the planet was ever going to celebrate and you wouldn't have known it from what Miss what Miss Bingeo cooked for Camelo Junior High's lunch. It was something surprise it was something surprise every day. Except the the a, that after the first day it wasn't something surprise anymore because we knew it was coming. It was just something. But I didn't complain. I remember the Wednesday, the Wednesday afternoon, Miss Biggio had come into Miss Baker's classroom, and the sound of her sadness, and I knew what burned guts felt like. Everyone else didn't complain, because they were afraid to. You don't complain when Miss Biggio stares at you as you're going through the lunch line. With her hands on her hips and her hair net pulled tight, you don't complain. Not even when she spreads her own happy holiday greetings. Take it and eat it, she said to Danny Hupfer when his hand hesitated over something. You're not supposed to examine it, she said to, Mar- to Meryl Lee, who was trying to figure out the surprise part. You waiting for another cream puff? She said to me. Don't count. Don't count on this millennium. And on the last day before holiday break, to my time, pick it up and be glad you're getting it. You shouldn't be here, sitting like a queen in a refugee home, while American boys are sitting in swamps on Christmas Day. You're the ones who should be here. They're the ones who should be here, not you. My Ty looked at her something. She looked down and kept going. She probably didn't see that Miss Bingo was pulling her hairnet down over her face because she was almost crying. And probably Miss Bingo didn't see that my Ty was almost crying too. But I did. I saw them, and I wonder how many gods were dying in both of them right then, and whether any of them could be saved. You'd think that Miss Baker would try to make up for the holiday disappointments of the Camillo Junior High kitchen over those three days, but she didn't. When we went back to the diagram sentences, focusing on the imperfect tenses, she convinced Mr. Sumowitz to start some pre-algebra um, equations in mathematics for you and me that Albert Einstein couldn't have figured out. She even bullied Mr. Petrelli 
into buckling down and making us present our Mississippi River and You projects out loud to the class. Mr. Petrelli had us finish in a day and a half, but Miss Baker didn't let up all three days. And we were the only class in Camilla Junior High who sweat who sweat behind a closed decorationless door in a hot decora- decorationless classroom. And did we complain? No. Because because at the at the first hint of a complaint, Miss Baker folded her arms cross across her chest and stood still staring at whoever had started to rebel to rebel until all rebellion died. That's how it was as we came up to a happy holidays. All that way until the last Wednesday afternoon. As everyone got ready to leave for Temple Bethel or St. Aunt Albert's, I figured I'd probably be diagramming sentences for the next hour and a half since we hadn't started another Shakespeare play yet. Just swell, but I was wrong. Mr. Hupfer and Mr. Swick said Miss Baker said said Miss Baker, I've arranged with your parents for you to stay in school this afternoon. Danny and Doug looked at me, and then at each other, then back at Miss Baker. Okay, by me. Okay, by me, Danny said. I'm so pleased to have your approval, Miss Baker said. Now, the rest of you. And there was an unusual hubbub of leaving while Danny and Doug sat back at their desks. What is, what's it about? Danny asked. I shrugged. Erasers or sentence diagramming? Maybe Shakespeare, I said. We looked over at Doug Schwedek. You didn't do November, you didn't do number 166, I said. He shook his head. You're sure? said Danny. Don't you think I'd know? said Doug. We weren't so sure, but actually he hadn't. Everyone left. Miss Baker went to her desk and opened her lower desk drawer. She took out three. No, not books of Shakespeare like you might think. Three brand new baseballs, their covers as white as snow, their threads tight and ready for fingers to grip into a curve. And then she reached in again, took out three mitts. Their leathery smell filled the room. She handed them to us. The leather was was soft and supple. We slipped our hands in and pushed the new baseballs in their deep pockets. My brother-in-law, whom I believe, Miss Hupfer and Mr. Hoodhood, both saw the other night following the extravaganza has asked me to give you these holiday gifts, compliments of the Baker Sporting Emporium, said Miss Baker, after telling me what happened during your time there. He and I made some arrangements for you to break in and break the mitts in, so take them down to the gymnasium, and don't throw balls in the hall, and dropping one's jaw and surprise Happens only in cartoons and bad plays. Gentlemen. Danny grinned and went out. Danny grinned as we went out. The gym is em- was empty. The gym is empty. Last period. Just giving us the afternoon off. But he was wrong too. The gym wasn't empty. Joe Peptone and Horace Clark were waiting for us in the bleachers in their Yankee uniforms, number 25 and number 20, two greatest players to put on Yankee pinstripes since Babe Ruth. Joe Peptone and Horace Clark, can you believe it? Which one of you is hauling? 
said Horace Clark. I pointed to my chest. And Doug? Doug slowly raised his hand. So, you're Danny, said Joseph Tone. Danny nodded. Horace Clark held up his mitt. Let's see your arm, Holling, he said. I threw with Horace Clark, and Danny and Doug threw with Joe Heptone. Then we switched, and Danny threw with Horace Clark, and Doug and I threw with Joe Heptone. Then we went outside under the warm sun and on a di- and, and on a diamond that hadn't been used since October. Horace Clark crouched behind the plate, and and I threw fastballs to him. And even once, a knuckleball, really. And then Danny got up, and Horace Clark pitched, and Joe Pepitone and I shied balls in the outfield. And then Joe Pepitone got up, and Doug and I shied balls in the outfield. And then we took some infield practice with Horace Clark. And then we stood around the diamond, Joe Pepitone at home, Danny at first, Horace at second, Doug at deep at deep shortstop, me at third, and we we whipped we whipped the ball to each other, around and around and around, as fast as we could, while Horace Clark chanted, Out of there, out of there, out of there. And the ball struck soft and deep in the pockets of our gloves and the smack of them and the smell of the gloves filled the bright yellow air while a breeze drew across us the whole time as soft as feathers or they signed our baseballs and signed our mitts they gave us each two tickets for opening day next april and they gave doug and danny their caps and for me Joe Patron gave me his jacket. Can you believe it? His jacket. When they drove off, it felt like a place inside me had been filled again. Our revels were not ended. Danny and Doug and I ran up to the third floor to find Miss Baker. Mr. Vaudery, Mr. Vaudery was already taking down the Christmas and Hanukkah decorations. The halls were ghostly dark and the classroom doors shut with the lights out behind them. Miss Baker had gone, but she had left a note on the door. Mr. Hooded, it said, read the tragedy of Macbeth for the first Wednesday of January. Too bad, said Danny. But Doug went on in, and he came out carrying a card box for number 166. From the coat room, he looked at us, shrugged, and halted away and halted away down the hall, staring under its clum- under its clumsy weight. We never saw it again. The next day, President Johnson cl- declared a Christmas a Christmas ceasefire in Vietnam, and the bomb stopped dry- dropping, and so the happy holidays finally began. <laughs>